Today we think about Jesus and recovery from paranoia. Um, those of you listening for the first time on YouTube or those of you listening for the first time, we're beginning a series, actually we're almost through a series on Jesus and recovery from mental health disorders. And I have something, I've got some good news and bad news. Jesus will help you. And the second thing is, here's the bad news. All of us have some form of maybe not full-blown mental health disorders, but we all got some form of almost everything we've talked about. And there's no such thing as normal. You are all weird. <laughs> you are all strange. You are abnormal <laughs> because normal doesn't exist. Normal is a balance between one extreme and the other, and both, the, almost every one of us are a little bit peaked on every single one of these mental health disorders. And that really helped me to learn that, <laughs> and I'll explain that a little bit later. But um, this is all about Jesus. Mental health disorders are, are part of the topic, but it's all about Jesus helping us recover. We begin uh, with the technical definition of paranoia. The DSM-5 Diagnostic Manual outlines several criteria for paranoia, and uh, it calls paranoia paranoid personality disorder. It says that this is a mental health disorder that starts in early adulthood, and it's talking about extreme paranoia. It's pervasive long-standing suspiciousness, and generalized mistrust of others. Well, if you grow up with, with parents that aren't very trustworthy, of course you're going to mistrust other people. If you had a best friend that had abandoned you or didn't prove trustworthy, it's really going to make you paranoid. And uh, we tend to transfer that paranoia onto God or to other people so, but it's talking here about a really strong, generalized mistrust of other people. Paranoid people tend to be hypersensitive, easily insulted, and are constantly scanning everything and everyone. They think they are always in danger, even though there is no evidence to support them being in danger. They are often startled and suspicious, and they usually have quite constricted emotional lives. Because they cannot be emotionally connected to other people, they isolate and withdraw. And all of us have done that to a degree. People with pervasive paranoia tend to bear grudges, are suspicious, see other people as threats. And of course, like every mental health disorder, they have also features of schizophrenia, narcissism, and borderline personality disorders, and tend to make small issues or molehills into mountains. Now, we're talking about abnormal fear. We're talking about abnormal distrust. We're talking about abnormal paranoia. I just want to give you a, a personal story so you won't think you're totally weird, OK? Uh, the first thing I did when I was in college, one of the requirements is to take general psychology. And Professor Harley, the first thing he did in that psych general psychology class, he gave every single student a questionnaire that scanned for all these mental health disorders. And so, you know, at 18 years old, you're not fully formed yet in your thinking. And so I took that thing, and he warned us now. He said, there's no such thing as being totally normal. You're going to be on one side or the other in some of these. And I was willing to be slightly on one side or the other, but I didn't want to be extremely <laughs> on one side or the other. And sure enough, when I took this thing, I was paranoid to taking it. <laughs> and when the scores of the tests came back, I was on the extreme side of paranoia. And that startled me. It was a wake-up call to me. And for the four years of college and a couple of years of graduate school, I thought, why am I so distrustful of everybody? 
Well, when I was a kid, we grew up in a fairly poor neighborhood. They stole my bicycle. They stole a bunch of stuff, you know. Uh, you know, other kids try to beat you up. But that's just normal. But why was I way on the side of paranoia? And then I figured it out. And I'll tell the answer later in the worship message. But uh, Jesus began to tell the disciples, don't be afraid. Don't yield to your fear. One of the first major miracles that Jesus did, he told Simon Peter, who was a fisherman on the Sea of Galilee, they fished all night, couldn't catch anything. He said, throw down your nets on the, go out and throw down your nets on the other side. Well, Peter had been fishing all night. He was a professional fisherman. He really knew what he was doing. And here's this religious leader saying, uh, put your nets down on the other side. But he, he obeyed Jesus. He sort of grudgingly. Sort of like you and I, when God tells us to do something, we'll try to obey him, but many times we're sort of grudgingly obeying him. And they got so many fish, they almost sank the boat. Their nets were absolutely full. These are tilapia. You, you know, you, buy, you can buy tilapia in the stores. And it was, tilapia live in the Sea of Galilee. And they asked their friends to come over with their other fishing boat and, and help them so that they wouldn't sink. And the first thing that Peter did when he saw this amazing miracle, he knelt at Jesus' feast and begged him, get away from me, master, for I am a sinful man. God loves people like Simon Peter. Simon Peter was with the other fishermen James and John, it's, this, this translation says Jacob, but you and I are familiar with James and John, the sons of Zebedee. And Peter and these, his two friends were absolutely awestruck at this miracle catch of fish. They were fishermen. They knew a miracle when they saw one. And Jesus said to Peter, Do not yield to your fear, Simon. From now on you will catch men for salvation. Do not yield to your fear. Many people around you and me, every day they're absolutely full of fear. You know, it'd be easy for Lori to be absolutely full of fear about these low, uh, the high blood count of white cells, you know. But, but Lori is like all of us. She's trying to not yield to fear. And, and fear of death like we talked about a few weeks ago. It's a real strong fear that many people have. And Jesus says to us and to Simon Peter, do not yield to your fear. Jesus knew that every normal human being, like Peter, James, and John, wanted to be, the sick part of them wanted to be captive to fear. And so God is saying to every single one of us, don't let fear be your master. Don't yield to fear. And fear is at the basis of paranoia. And uh, I was taught by my grandmother to be paranoid and to be full of fear. And her daughter, my mother, what grandma didn't teach me about being paranoid and fear, my mom finished a job. <laughs> and then life itself seemed to be saying what Grandma Norris and Phyllis Cobb are teaching me, be full of fear. Don't trust anybody. We're everywhere you are. Be afraid. And some fear is legitimate, you know. But to be swallowed up by fear is what Jesus is talking about. To be captured by fear. To be driven half crazy by fear. Don't do that, Jesus says. Don't yield to your fear. You can face your fear, Jesus is telling Peter, James, and John. You don't have to yield to your fear. You can face it. And the way to face your fear is to talk about it. And then 
get it out in the open and then look fear directly in the eye and in the power of Jesus and in the name of Jesus say, I'm fighting you, fear. I'm fighting you, paranoia. I'm trusting in God to make it through this day. And we all have some fears, but we got to fight it. We don't have to live in abject fears. Now, some fears are legitimate. Uh, you know, I was always pretty paranoid of A-10 gunships, uh, and they're called warthogs, and they, they fire a machine, machine gun shell that's that big, and it's louder than thunder, you know. So uh, I uh, was on a war game exercise, and it went on for two weeks. Every night there was machine gun fire. Every night enemy were trying to probe our, our lines. I hadn't sleep for two weeks. Finally, I just said, enough of this. And when it got dark, I crawled out between two machine guns and crawled until nobody could see me. And then I stood up and I'm trying to find a place to sleep that didn't have machine guns going all night long. And I went into this real thick grove of pine trees about 12 feet, 13 feet high, and there was pine needles, wonderful mattress underneath. I still had my helmet on, and I, I crawled in there and immediately I went to sleep because I hadn't slept for two weeks, you know. And then all day long, you're up running around. I had crawled into a warthog, an A-10 gunnery ship firing range. <laughs> and uh, as soon as it, was, as it was light, A-10 gunship came over me at treetop level, so it was only about 20 feet above me, and fired these things, which are louder than thunder, <laughs> And I jerked up out of my sleep and hit my head on a pine tree branch and it knocked me out. <laughs> Fortunately, I had the helmet on, you know. And when I woke up, I realized another gunship came over and fired above me, and I realized I had crawled into an A-10 gunnery range. <laughs> and I laughed at myself, you know. I laughed at my fears. That's a normal reaction, you know, when you haven't slept for two weeks and then all of a sudden you're abruptly woken by something louder and thunder. So I crawled out again, and I thought, how am I going to get back in there? Well, everybody else was exhausted, you know, and I was able to crawl back in between those two machine gun nests, and nobody knew I was gone all night. <laughs> For 30 years, I never told this story because I wanted to get promoted, you know. <laughs> uh, and uh, I realized, you know, I need to laugh about that fear. And you know what I'd encourage you to do? Laugh at your own fears. Laugh at yourself. Tell yourself, get a grip. Trust God. If Peter, James, and John can do it, if Mary Magdalene and Martha and Mary could do it, I can do it too. And just, just laugh at your fears. There's nothing the devil loves, hates worse than people who laugh at their fears and say, I'm going to trust God. So every day, you and I have normal fears. Just trust God. And there's a real long passage here, you know, but I just, I just love it. And listen to what Jesus is saying here. Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Listen to me. Never let anxiety enter your hearts. Never worry about any of your needs. This is a direct command from Jesus. If we didn't have the power to do this, Jesus wouldn't command us to do it. This, Jesus commands us, never worry about your needs. Life is infinitely more than just food or clothing. Look at these carefree birds. We, we talked about that earlier in our worship service. All the blackbirds are coming back. You know, I'm watching buzzards. We had... Uh, on our silo at our place in the country, it faces north, and the first few days of spring and summer, there's north winds, so this is a perfect place for buzzards to be. So this morning we had a pair of buzzards on our silo. That's the first sign of spring in northeast Kansas, is the buzzards come back. And there must have been a hundred buzzards over the pork uh, uh, manufacturing uh, plant in hold them the other day. I'm talking a hundred buzzards. And I asked a friend of mine, why are all the buzzards here? Well, that's where all the pork that's not used for hot dogs and hams 
is located, and the buzzards have a real feast there. So spring is coming, you know, and uh, the buzzards are coming back, the bluebirds are coming, uh, blackbirds are coming back, also the, the robins are starting to come back. And uh, I'm not going to worry. Spring is always going to come in your life. If you're a worrier, God will bring spring to you in the middle of winter. God takes care of every one of these birds, Jesus says, and you're a lot more valuable. So be carefree in the care of God. I hope you remember that all this week. When you want to worry about something, remember Jesus' words here. Be carefree in the care of God. You're a daughter and son of God. God really loves you. Jesus is commanding us to be carefree in the care of God. And Jesus says, stop worrying about clothing. Stop worrying about anything. Just live life carefree and free from care. Live above your anxious cares, God is saying. God cares about your personal needs, your emotional needs, your spiritual needs. Live above anxious cares. Now, when they're selling life insurance to you, they want to raise your anxiety. So you buy a car like they want to sell you and life insurance policy like they want to sell you. Don't buy into this anxious care you see on television. You read in the newspapers and so forth. It's good to plan for the future, but don't be paranoid about the future. Everybody is really not out to get you. Used car salesmen are out to get you. <laughs> People that are selling something you don't really need, they are out to get you. But as a general rule, when your doctor tells you to do something, your doctor is not out to get you. Your doctor is out to help you. When your friends say, give you good advice or advice you've never heard before, uh, Kathleen's told me about some vitamins that I needed and I think they've increased my health significantly. Not everybody's out to get you. And of course, some people are, but paranoid people say, everybody's out to get me. No, there's, there's some good people in the world. And so each day, God will supply your needs. And Jesus says in the last part of the scripture in Luke 12, he says, don't ever be afraid, dearest friends. Your loving Father joyously gives you his kingdom realm with all its promises. Aren't these wonderful words? Don't be afraid, dearest friends. You are a friend of God. There's actually a wonderful hymn that talks about that. You're a friend of God. God knows all your weak points. God still calls you and I friends. We're God's friends. Jesus said so. And Jesus is telling us to face our fears. Peter, James, and John, and Jesus faced their fears. And they moved from a fear-based life to a faith-based obedience to God. And remember earlier I told you why I was so paranoid? I grew up in a church Although they talked about the love of Jesus, basically it was you need to be afraid of the devil. You need to be afraid of everybody else. You need to not trust anybody, including the police, the government, or anybody. And oh, by the way, don't trust your doctor or your nurse too much. Basically, there was a lot of fear, even though they talked about loving Jesus, I got a, a big dose of fear in the church where I grew up, of course I was going to be paranoid. I was trying to follow God. And the religious people, now notice I didn't say spiritual, the religious people were teaching me to be afraid about everything in my life, whereas Jesus is just saying the opposite. Trust God. Refuse to be afraid. Live above your anxious cares. And especially, Jesus is saying, hey, God loves you and I love you. 
Dearest friends, your loving Father wants you to be carefree in the care of God. Isn't that exciting? You and I can live as these little boys and girls that are here in our church service today. They're living carefree. They really trust their mom and dad. They love their mom and dad. Every kid knows their mom and dad aren't perfect, even little preschool kids. But basically, they can trust their mom and dad. And I want to tell you, brothers and sisters in Christ, you can trust God. You can live carefree like a little child that has parents that are love them and feeding them and clothing them. You can live carefree. You don't have to be paranoid anymore. You don't have to worry all the time. It's okay to plan, but refuse to worry because Jesus says you and I can do it. We can refuse to worry and live carefree in the care of God. Amen.